Who the Wild Things Are with Ryan McGuire. You gotta listen to your body. Oh my God, maybe, you know, I could get out there. I could do this. Let's take a ride. Find your wild side. Real stories. See with your own eyes. It's so beautiful. I'm gonna have the best time out here. Yeah, I was in tears. I was just like, that's the best, man. Hey, what's up, everyone? Welcome back to Who the Wild Things Are, the show that brings you folks that have turned their passions into a priority. Today, we have an awesome conversation with Callie Russell, who recently appeared on Alone Season 7. Uh, so let's get into it. Hey! Wow, look at that background. Beautiful. You yeah. look like a movie cool. star. Hey, what's up, man? Not too much. Weather looks okay out there, yeah? Uh, yeah, the sun actually came out today. It was incredible. <laughs> nice, nice. How uh, how cold is it there? Um, it's not really that cold for January. It's not cold at all. It's probably 30, 28, 28 oh, nice. or thirty. Yeah. Yeah. So about like Colorado, probably right now. Yeah. Yeah. It's been a weird winter. Like the lack of snow and like harsh weather has been weird. Yeah, it's been weird. We kind of got winter early and fast and cold, and now it's been pretty mild. So. Who knows? It'll be interesting to see what happens. But um, yeah, we'll yeah. see. Hopefully the, the goats don't knock over the the setup here. We just <laughs> got everything, <laughs> everything adjusted. I was today um, worked with, I taught a class and worked with this group of homeschool kids. And um, so the spot that I'm at right now, I met them at this place on the river. And so we worked on skills all day and played games and it was super fun and they just left. And then, um, so I got all ready just in time. Perfect timing here. Awesome. Yeah. It sounds yeah. like a sweet day. Yeah. So Callie, I think everybody or most people know you and, uh, your recent stories and epic adventure on alone and no doubt a good reason to be well known, but I think, it's always cool to start with a little bit of background and kind of like learn a little bit more intimate knowledge about who the person was previous to the show. So um, tell me, what, it, what was it like as a kid? Did you grow up on a farm? Did you grow up outdoors or was it, was it a typical childhood? Right. Yeah, that's a great question. A lot of people ask me that. They're like, you must have grown up with some freaky backwoods parents, right? Yeah. <laughs> and that's, I, I mean, my parents, they... Um, uh, they're definitely, they're both amazing people. Uh, I love them so much. And, but I grew up a very mainstream life. So I grew up in mainstream world, mainstream life, mainstream parents. Um, you know, we did go camping and that kind of thing, which I'm so thankful for that they, um, they appreciated the outdoors. And so I got to get out of the outdoors. Um, and, um, my dad is what you might call a, non-conformist uh <laughs> so i got introduced to just like you there's a lot of different ways to think about being in the world and what kind of life you can live um but i basically grew up mainstream normal life i grew up in a city and mm. i felt i knew that i didn't want that for myself i knew it was very very clear to me from a young age that i didn't want to spend the rest of my life living in a city and um just working a a job so I, from a young age i kind of felt this pull to the wild to the natural world and as i got older and all these forces were trying to keep me like pull me more into the city pull me more into jobs more into careers more into the indoors i was like i didn't i didn't want to do that and i tried it I definitely tried it um, in my early adulthood and I just, I couldn't ignore this pull. I felt it just deep in my bones to just get, get outside. So uh, I made that choice. Hey, get out of there. Stop that. The goats are all around me. You guys can't see them, <laughs> but I'm just waiting for them to come and crash in. They, are you going to be good girl and just come lay on my lap? Just no, she's walking exactly under the tripod. Uh, yeah, anyway, just a little entertainment for you guys. Uh, I love that. Anywho. <laughs> no, that's awesome. That's uh, that's cool because I think the automatic assumption is like backwoods folk were raised by backwoods folk. And it's just not always the case. You know, I, I know a lot of folks that are 
uh, really into the natural world and, and getting out in the bush that we're raised, you know, in cities, just like you were saying. So I think that's a really cool insight. And it's inspiring to people that are maybe not from that walk of life, that it's never too late or you can always start pursuing a, a rewilding experience. So it's awesome. Yeah, it is never too late to follow your heart, follow your passion, follow your natural interests. And that, I mean, I went from, the goats have their eyes on something. I don't know what it is. Um, you, I went from, you know, just, I didn't know, I didn't have any connection to my food. Zero, like zero. Didn't grow up on a farm. Didn't grow up in the back country. I had absolutely no idea where my came, food came from, my clothes, water, shelter, everything, just city life, pure city life. And I didn't, I had no clue, you know, uh, most of the things I know now I learned in my adult life. I started in my, I guess I was probably, I started dabbling in stuff around 18, 19 and stuff, but it wasn't until I was in my early twenties that I started to really dive into these, the harder skills um, that are more of the ancestral skills, not just camping skills. I kind of grew up a little bit with camping, basic camping skills, you know, like basic fire tending, little things like that. But I had never killed an animal. I'd never taken apart an animal. I never seen the inside of an animal, anything like that, you know? So I think, um, I just think it's good for, you know, there's, it's, you can't predict your future. Like looking back, if I were to imagine where I'm at now, you know, 20 years ago, I would have thought, well, is that even possible? Because 20 years ago, I had all this inspiration and ideas. I had intentions. I knew I had these dreams. Uh, when I was a, a teenager, I would dream of like living in the wilderness with groups of people. And I wanted that. And I started seeking out the skills, but I had, it seemed it all, it seemed like was a dream. And then, but I set the intention and slowly just started making those actions towards that intention. And mm -hmm. 20 years later, I feel like I'm living my dream, which I thought was impossible. So. That's amazing. There's a yeah. great question from the, the chat. Um, and I think about this a lot. What is like the first moment for me? Like what, what do I look back as being like my first moment in ancestral skills? Um, what, when you think back, like, this is the moment where I transitioned to like putting all my focus or not even all your focus, but a serious amount of attention on learning, like for you, I guess it would be processing animals. What was the first time and what was that experience like? Excuse me. Do you want to, do you want to answer the question? <laughs> <laughs> What's up, dude? <laughs> this is Catan. Hi, Catan. This is Catan. Yeah. What kind She's of goat is Catan? Uh, she's an alpine, so cool. all my goats are alpine. Um, <laughs> okay, yeah, what was the question? The first, so, oh, what was when your I first really started... experience, yeah, with the animal processing, and, and how did that get going? Yeah, so when I was um, 18, I started to dive into sort of like alternative culture, um, and started spending time with people living outside of what would be mainstream. Like I, um, worked and lived with like the Rennies, like the Renaissance fair people that traveled with the fair. And I lived at this, like, um, I don't even know what to call it. It's not really a hippie commune. It's not that, <laughs> but this place, this community, I lived in this. It's kind of like that crazy community in the desert. Um, and just different. So I started dabbling in these alternative lifestyles and um, learning about natural building. I went to different workshops and went to different hubs where a bunch of people were working on natural building and did kind of like natural building internships and that kind of stuff. So when I was 18, I started dabbling into alternative lifestyles and seeing what other people did that was more like earth-based connection skills mm -hmm. and also just living sort of out of that mainstream path that's sort of presented to all of us, you know, go to college, get a job, buy a house, keep working in the job, pay for the house, go on vacation every now and then raise a family, um, which nothing's wrong. I don't want to say anything's like wrong with that, but it just didn't resonate with me. Mm -hmm. And, uh, 
But then, um, but I did feel the pressure from society to do those things and have an education. So I ended up going to college and it was right after um, I wrapped up college. The whole time I was in college, I felt that pull, pulling me, pulling me, pulling me. And I'd work on skills a little bit. Like I, you know, on my front porch, I was like trying to learn about friction fire and that kind of <laughs> stuff. Like any books I could get my hands on. Um But then after college, right after I started working in wilderness therapy, um, this place called Anasazi Foundation down in Arizona. And um, that was this huge turning point for me because I met other people that were interested in the same things that I were. And I wasn't just um, that. So that was huge, just being introduced to the skills community. And so then and this was the coolest thing I still remember. So. This wilderness therapy program, there's no, um, you know, buildings or base or structure. It's like everybody has their little blanket roll pack and is just roaming through the mountains. It's incredible. And so I remember when I was just walking, it was me, one other like young 20 year old. um, I think I was 22, 21 or 22 when I started doing that. And a crew of teenagers, none of them which wanted to be there, you know, <laughs> and we were just walking through the desert, through the mountains, crossing rivers, there's no trails. And all we had all our stuff with us. It was just this little path, this tiny little blanket. It was like a wool blanket wrapped up with a little bit of food, our fire kit, our knives, yeah. um, our canteens, very basic gear. And we were rolling. And I was like, this is what I want to do for a long time. I was like, I just want to walk across the state and walk across the country and just keep walking. And so it was at that time that I started to dive, you know, headfirst or whatever (laughs) into this stuff. And I moved, that's when I got the courage to move out of, um, I was like renting a house, you know, and I stopped, I like moved out and I just moved into my car kept working that job. And then I just started from that point on, just started camping. And mm-hmm. I've been basically camping for 10 years now. Um, and so that was like when I was early twenties is when I took that dive, that dive in. Yeah. That's awesome. That's such yeah. a cool story. And mm-hmm. everyone else is saying that's a, that's an awesome, awesome story. And I know Anasazi just, you know, through people like Ford, um, I've picked brains about that, that system and and what they're all about. And it sounds like a really awesome group of people. Um, So that it's super cool that you get to come from kind of that same group, like of like-minded individuals that just want to hang out in the bush and just like, Mm -hmm. and just get out there. So it's really cool when you meet a community that's Mm -hmm. like confirming all these feelings you've had in your head Mm -hmm. for so long. And then like it all clicks and kind of comes together. Yeah. And and you, feel a little bit um you're like oh I'm not just crazy because other people feel it too and you know the older I get it's like a lot of people feel that draw back to our roots it's all of our roots even you know even people that love you know that are fully embracing the modern world and like just you know they're totally in it and developing new technology and they're just in this world that we all, every single person comes from all of our roots are in the earth-based skills, all of us. Um, mm-hmm. doesn't matter where your ancestry is from. All of our ancestors had to know how to do these kinds of things and live with the land. Otherwise, you know, we wouldn't have gotten to where we are today. So it was really beautiful finally meeting, meeting some other, some other like-minded souls, um, a bunch of people are asking, like, if I still work at that job and how I make money and stuff, maybe I'll just yeah. talk about that real quick. Yeah, um, that was my next question. Yeah. And so in the beginning, when I made that lifestyle shift, I I knew that I really wanted to learn how to be self-sufficient, but I didn't have any of those skills to start. And I knew that it was going to take a lot of my time and I probably, it might be hard to balance, you know, working and doing these things. Some people can do that, but I just wanted to just, just dive straight in. (laughs) And so I did save some money to start. I saved up. Um, But then I made a conscious choice to reduce 
what I spent money on basically and reduce my cost. So that was the first step is just needing less money, taking steps to need less money, to have less money sustain what I do. Um, and for years, I mean, I got by on so little. It was yeah. insane what I would get by on. I mean, it was just, <laughs> it was adventurous. I mean, I, wa- I, I did, I did spend a lot of time just like walking across, you know, um, I walked a lot across a lot of Arizona and just walked all over the place. And I would just get by on, uh, you know, I dumpster dive and thrift store clothes and just that kind of stuff and just live with really little. Um, but eventually as I kept practicing these skills and kept practicing them, I knew enough to be able to teach workshops. And so I started teaching workshops, um, or at least I would help other people teach workshop. I kind of like mentored under some other people that knew what was up. And then I kind of like worked my way up and then I was able to start teaching and sharing. And then, you know, other people just, I would meet, they're like, I, you know, really want to spend time in the wilderness. I want to do these things. And I'm like, well, I'm no expert, but I have learned a lot in my time. And so be sharing that with people. And so now, well, I'll speak in just the last few years, that's how I've made, I don't need that much money, but what I do use, I make, um, teaching workshops and also making things too. Like this one, for example, a few years ago, I was just like living in the mountains and I just sit up there with my goats and weave baskets and stuff and then hike into town. And there was this like coffee shop and I would sell and I, they'd buy all my baskets off me and then they'd have them in there. And then I'd hike back into the mountains And then, so those, then, you know, when I'd come back in, they'd all right, we sold, you know, 10 of your baskets or whatever. And then I'd get the, the money. And so it was just like little things like that. Um, And now it's a little more, well, it's actually still just as crazy, but (laughs) stop eating that, please. (laughs) No, that's a, it's an awesome story. It sounds like, uh, to me, I just think of like infinite freedom. It's just like the, despite the, the lack of income it could be five dollars it could be five thousand but it's really hard to exchange money for freedom right that's the that's the trade-off the trade-off that you're kind of looking for is just being able to go sit in the mountains and just kind of do your own thing and not be on anyone else's time it's kind of an invaluable experience Yeah. And for me, it's a lot, it's a, it's definitely about freedom and it's about remembering what it means to be a human being. And when, you know, growing up, there's all this focus, like make money, make money, make money. Like, is that my purpose in life to make money? No, it's not. You know, and then that like that kind of realization combined with learning when I was a teenager and I learned just how the world worked and how we got to where we are today, learned about the, you know, just how we went from basically hunter gatherer societies to major industrial societies. And that made me learning about where my food came from, learning about where cities get their resources from and what kind of impact that's having on other ecosystems and other people. To me, that was really devastating. And I was like, you know, I think that we can do better. I think as a species, we can do better. And for me, learning how to move forward and look forward into the future, like what is the future? I felt like I had to look back into the past first. And so that's like where I started was in the past, like just focusing on the basics, living simply, learning, trying to learn how our ancestors lived on this planet. And so a lot of this is about remembering to what it means to be a human being. And a lot of that is, part of that is a sense of freedom too. Um, but that's a not exactly a rabbit hole, but a whole other conversation about freedom, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I think you make a great point. It's uh the the looking back to see where we're going right it's uh i I remember the the feeling of like your first couple uh notches like on your belt where you get your first hand drill fire or like you get your first naturally made knife 
or like just just little things and you realize that this is how people have been doing it for centuries and and you start checking off those boxes and it's it's super fulfilling can you hear me kelly yes i can Let's hear you go. okay yeah what someone called my sister just called me and um this happens i silent or um do not disturb or whatever that is so that doesn't happen and it, they still come through. So I don't know. This has happened before and it messes the whole thing up. So I honestly, I forgot to turn on my do not disturb. I turned on the do not disturb last time and everything came through. I was like, what is the point yeah. of this button? Yeah, so, totally. That. Yeah, exactly. So no. whatever. Oh. No worries. We're, <laughs> we're back on good problem solving. I was about to sign off and then I was like, no, we'll just wait. No, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> good. All right. So what, what was your question? Not exactly sure. We're going to keep rolling. So <laughs> you had a badass life. You did a bunch of badass stuff. You developed all these skills. How did you hear about Alone? And like, what was your reaction? Like, how, how did that whole process leading up to Alone go? That's a great question. So, uh, well, I was very disconnected from, you know, modern stuff, t definitely TV, movies, new music, um, all that kind of thing. Cause I was really spending a ton, mo like all of my time out in the wilderness. And I just come in a little bit, you know, call mom, I'm alive and like go back out. <laughs> and, um, so, but in one of these stints, so with that wilderness therapy, people ask if I still work at Anasazi. I don't work there, but like over the last decade, you know, I started working them for the first time uh, over 10 years ago now. And I've come back, co come and gone a few times. And one of my times back there, maybe like five years ago or something, um, the, the teenagers, they were updating me on things like, what's a hashtag? <laughs> I had no idea, um, things like that. But they also told me, they're like, there's this TV show called Alone and you totally have to go on it. And I was like, oh, and they told me the premise, they're like, you get 10 items. And I'm like, could 10 items, could one of my 10 items be a goat? Or like <laughs> three of my items be goats or something? And they're like, I don't know. And I was like, well, I would probably do that if a goat could be one of my items. <laughs> and that was like, I, that was the first time I heard about it. Um, and then a few years later, um, well, whatever, a few years later, they contacted me, actually. I, I didn't um, apply. They'd heard about me through the grapevine, I guess, or through the skills community about some crazy goat woman. Uh, <laughs> I don't know <laughs> what they said. <laughs> and uh, and they, they reached out to me, and I was like, oh, like, I don't think I want to be on TV because there's a lot, um, you know, that's kind of the world of smoke and mirrors. And I wasn't, I didn't desire fame or anything like that. And I'm like, I just don't know if that's the kind of life move that I want to make. Uh, and so I kind of, I kind of declined. Um, and then they, you know, next season or whatever they, and I hadn't been thinking about it, just moved on, kept doing what I do. Then they reached out again and they're like, Callie, you know, do you want to do it? I was like, you know, um, and, and then I decided to do it that time because I just saw I was instead of focusing on the things, I, the cons, you know, like, oh, people are going to know you, <laughs> know your face or <laughs> whatever. Yeah. Um, not that that's a problem, you guys. It's all good. But you know what I mean? You guys can probably imagine what what you're like, do I want like my life to be public? You know, those things. So I started focusing on all the benefits and the positives. Like, this is an amazing opportunity. This is an absolutely incredible once in a lifetime opportunity to change my life for the positive. Like not only, I mean, of course the prize money is a huge lure. You're like, holy moly, half a million or a million bucks. Like think of all the good things that you could do with that kind of money. It could just ripple out and change so many lives, start so many powerful projects and communities and all kinds of rad stuff with that sort of money. But then also just the opportunity to dive way, way deep into that solo wilderness experience. I just, it, it became very clear to me. I had this really sort of, um, 
mystical experience that was like, yes, this is what's on your path. This is what you need to do. And so I listened, I listened to it. You kind of have to listen to those big, the big signs that come in your life. Like this is a doorway, walk through it. And you're like, no, I'm scared. I don't want to walk through the door. I want to stay where I'm comfortable. And you, you just have to walk through those doors. So that's kind of what it was. And I was scared. There was like part of me that was definitely scared to just step out basically onto this, the stage, you know, Mm -hmm. and just like be viewed by the world. But it was that fear, you know, I think it's really important to do things that you are afraid of and step out of that comfort zone and push yourself Mm -hmm. to those next uh, levels. So. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. It's such a, it's like a cool revelation that you started and you're like, no. And then you're like, maybe. And then you're like, okay, I'm going to do it. Like this is, this is something that can unlock, you know, future potential, both with your lifestyle and, and helping others. And it's a, it's a cool story. And, mm-hmm. you know, honestly, there is so many people that reached out to me and were like, Callie's my favorite person ever on alone. Like, absolutely love her and i i just thought it was really cool i thought that your personality came through so strong like i know that in alone you film eight hours a day for 87 days or whatever it is and Mm -hmm. they condense it down to right an hour maybe of total filming time so Mm -hmm. it's like for your personality and all that stuff to come through so vividly. That's why I was like, Callie is the coolest. I just, I need to talk to her. That was, Aww. that was kind of my motivation. Oh, uh, well, th- <laughs> Hey, you, Hey, <laughs> thanks. Yeah. And that was another concern, like, you know, feeling hesitant to go on to the show because you have no, um, you you film yourself excuse me she's like trying she wants to sit basically where the this the camera is <laughs> she's just a little just like feels displaced she doesn't know where to sit down um <laughs> anyway that was one of my hesitancies because you film you do all these things you are like your most vulnerable doing an experience like that. You are raw. You are vulnerable. You are like cracked open and like oozy goozy for the world to see you like in your, you know, your hardest times maybe. And yeah. you're just there like out in the open. And then they take the footage and then they edit it however they see fit to tell a story. So you may, you, your true personality or your experience may or may not come across in the final edit and so that was another thing that was very scary to just like surrender that way the kind of surrender to just be like i'm gonna have this like life-changing experience it's gonna be very deeply personal to me but then an edited version will be shown to the world and everybody will think that is all that happened and that's right when it may or may not be accurate to how it was for you so, but I do feel, of course, like, so a lot of people had questions in. I saw a bunch of people just said, um, was the show scripted? No, the show is not scripted. That's one of the cool things about Alone is it's actually a real reality experience. Um, other re- reality TV shows, I have no interest in going on because it's just, it's just kind of nonsense. There's a film crew. It's, it's not reality. It's very far from reality alone is the real deal it's a it's a very real like personal journey it's a very real survival experience you literally are in a survival like a real survival situation because there's a safety team like back at base camp and you have the thing and you can be like oh my gosh i broke my leg will you come save me and then they come and save you but there's so many things that a your um telecommunications could not work And there's a bunch of things that'll kill you faster than they can rescue you. Like if you're falling in the ice, you know, and like if you hit your head when you fell into the ice, you know, there's all kinds of ways that you could die a lot quicker than they would be able to reach you. Oh, look at that. So cute. She figured it out. She just laid down. Look. Oh, she's a sweet girl. Oh, it is a cute little goat. Oh, yeah. She, I can't really see. Anyway. (laughs) she figured it out that's good um 
any way. So alone is not scripted. Everything is just, you film your, it's self shot. You film yourself and then, um, then you hand the footage over and they edit it. So it's not scripted, but it is edited. So that's the thing. Um, and they might, they, it is possible for them to like things that you said, they can cut, you know, you said one thing this day and then a week later you say something else and they cut those two things together to form right. like a sentence. And you're like, ha, huh, I didn't say that. Um, so you never know what your edit's going to be like. And that's a little challenging. And for a lot of people that go on the show, that's a very hard thing for them to deal with um, because they feel like they like their story is not really told at all and so a lot of people that are on the show kind of struggle with that in some form mm -hmm. another of, of another and my experience obviously definitely edited like you said there's you know count thousands of hours of footage down to one hour lots of things happened that weren't in the cut um but i and things a little you know there were some things that were like out of order the days were wrong stuff like that but I do feel like my um, like my essence came through and yeah. I'm very, 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 very thankful for that. And like when I was out there, I would tell myself, you know, like who knows how they're going to edit me? Like it could be anything. And the thing that I really cared about is that I, I was hoping that my gratitude would come through. If nothing else came through, I just hoped that they would show me being grateful. I was like, I don't care if they make me look like a fool. I don't care how they make me look as long as I... I'm a grateful fool, you know, and, but I do feel like I, my personality and my essence and all that like really came through. I was like, Oh, that's, that's perfect. That's me. That's definitely me. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. And the, the, the gratitude thing, definitely like you would wake up on harsh days and just like be grateful for the sunrise and, and, you know, have very few qualms with where you were and what was going on and what your experience was. So yeah. that was something I really appreciated about your perspective. It's like, you'll see a lot of people go out and, you know, bitch about the spot that they got their plot of land or um, complain about this or that. And I don't remember ever seeing you complain about anything. It was just gratefulness and just like pure joy to be out there, which is probably a reflection on your lifestyle and like the way that you've lived. Um, so it's really cool to see. Oh, thanks for saying that, Ryan. Thanks. Yeah, for yeah, sure. Yeah, no. it, it was, I mean, that's just how, that's just, it, you know, that's like the thing that I have control over in my life, right? It's like how I react to things and like things are, if things are hard, if I focus on how hard they are, um, it's not going to make them any easier. <laughs> it's going to make right. it harder, you know? And like, same thing, like my, um, the location that I was dropped at was a very challenging location. It was a north facing bowl, yeah. north facing bowl. And I, we have boundaries and I was able to wander and like hunt um, in a pretty big area. But as far as where I could put my shelter was limited because they have to be able to come in and um, rescue you. So you can't like have your shelter like way, oh. way far. So I basically had to camp in this bowl that was north facing and the wind would yeah. whip off the lake into that bowl and it didn't get a lot of sun and it was like cliffs and it was just a it was a really challenging spot but instead of just sitting there and being like oh I got a bad spot like I guess like that's it for me you know that's it like I didn't get a good spot and I'm just whatever it's like no I'm like this place is yeah it's a challenging very challenging place but it's freaking beautiful and there's going to be something about it. That's good. There, or, I mean, it's all good, but there's going to be something about it. That is um, like an extra little benefit, like a resource that's there. That's not at another place. And so it's like my job to focus on that stuff, not focus on how challenging it is. Like it was so hard to find a place to put, I got a, a low battery warning. That's all right. <laughs> well, we'll just go until, It'll probably go for a long time, but if I disappear unexpectedly, we'll we'll walk back to the truck and can plug in, or we can just be like, "Well, that was a good, a fun well, talk." <laughs> just like uh, just like a north facing bowl that's windswept in the Arctic, we'll make it work. Yeah, <laughs> word. <laughs>
<laughs> so, uh, so alone, awesome experience. Um, some crazy shit also happened to you. One of them that comes to my mind was you crawled down into <laughs> basically this rock cliff that like, if you're claustrophobic, like you are not going in there. You get, you get down in there. You yop this porcupine with a with an arrow, and then you pull it out. And while you're processing it, one of the spines goes. Just so, if you guys haven't seen it, she had a porcupine spine go through her shoulder, right down into the back. What happened? I mean, like how how did how did it get there? What what was that about? Well, um, the other goats are coming. She's trying to sit in here, too. Everyone's trying to sit. There's not room for everyone. Stop that. Um, <laughs> yeah, so that, that porcupine quill, I don't know how it got in my shoulder, but the thing is, so porcupine quills are barbs. They have these barbs, and so yeah. they work deeper and deeper and deeper into things, which yep. I learned about that. Yeah. <laughs> and so... I don't know how it got, it got on me somehow. And then um, it was actually, it wasn't even, I don't know how they show it in the show. It's like the same day or something, but I think it was a day or two later. And I could feel it. I like all day. I was like, oh, there's something in my shoulder. That's like annoying, you know? And I just kept, I just kept doing what I was doing. I was like, I'll check it out tonight, you know, but I kept doing what I was doing. And I think in the show, they make me look like I stop what I'm doing and go deal with it right away. I didn't. I just left that thing in my shoulder for the whole day. And then at night, yeah, I mean, you got work to do. The days are short, you know? <laughs> yeah. The days are so short. So, like, you kind of have to make use of your daylight. And I was like, I'll just, I'll see whatever is going on in my shoulder at night. And I finally get in at night, you know, stir up my fire and stuff. And I'm like, man, what is in there? And I, like, take off all the layers of clothes. And I find it in there. But what's crazy is it went through, like, four sweaters or something like that, you know? It just dug through all it the sweaters. like, that huge parka on, too. Yeah. I don't think it went through that. I don't think I was wearing it that day. But still, like, four layers, four or five layers of wool, you know? That's, right. like, a crazy quill. Crazy quill. Did, did you, like, sling it over your back? Or, like, it's such a weird spot, right? Like, so, like, if you're processing an animal, the animal's in front of you, typically, like, down on the ground or, like, on some kind of post. Mm -hmm. Somehow, this thing lands in the hardest spot to get it out by yourself because you can't see it. Yeah. It's, right? It's back here. You're just, like, feeling around for it and just, like, oh, I think it's about here. Yeah. 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 And how it got there, I don't know. I definitely did not put the porcupine over my shoulder. That would be a bad choice. <laughs> I think if I were to guess, because I had, I was like collecting and saving the quills to do quill work because um, people that practice quill work, they, they're like very special. And so I didn't want to waste any of the quills. So I was like collecting them all right. in this tin can that I had found. And so what I think is probably when I took like a, my outer sweater off, I might've set it down somewhere and it picked up a quill and then I put it back on the next day ah. or something like that is okay. what I would guess. Um, but then, yeah, I couldn't see it. And so I had to use the viewfinder of the camera. So you guys got a good angle. You guys could see it good because I was using the viewfinder of the camera as a, as a, a mirror, basically. <laughs> yeah. No, you nailed the shot of it. Like when you see it, you're like, oh, like <laughs> there's a quill on her back. Like it, it's a crazy shot. But like you were saying, it's, uh, it's a rare resource to find something um, like before conditioning or shaping that's that sharp in the wild. So like having quill like available when you're when you want it to use it, it's it's a great resource. So there's kind of a balance there because they are dangerous, but at the same time, it's a great resource. Yeah, totally, totally, totally. Um, someone said maybe it was a loose one when I crawled in the crevice. Um, Riverbed Longbow said that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it could have been. I don't know. It was mostly just like ice in the crevice. But it could, it totally could have been. That would make sense because I was crawling all around in there. I crawled way more. That was, oh, when I crawled in the crevice, I put the dang GoPro on, but the batteries, the that time of the season that it was so cold that the GoPro batteries, like fresh ones, would last for like 30 seconds. 
Oh no. Yeah, and then they would just they would just die. So I was so bummed that the GoPro wasn't working um, for that shot. But that's the other thing about being self shot. If you had a crew, they'd be like, "Oh, here's a, here's whatever for you." But you're just out there, and you're like, "Well, I got to make this happen, and I got to do it regardless if the camera's going to work or not." So. No, that's literally. So that's what I try to explain when people ask me about uh, different shows. Is I always say self shot is in a different realm it's it's not the same sport it's a completely different deal anything mm-hmm. that is like survival or adventure when it's self shot there's no other person there it's completely different Absolutely. all of that other stuff goes out the window like it doesn't seem like that big of a difference if you're not in the bush a lot but it is truly a different sport Absolutely. Yeah, Riverbed Longbows just said that he's seen loose ones in the den before. So that's like a great theory I could have easily gotten. In yeah, fact, that's I'm good surprised insight. I didn't get more <laughs> doing that then. Well, thank God you didn't. That was uh <laughs> that is good insight, especially, you know, like when porcupines get scared when you're chasing men, their quills go up in the back, right? So maybe he heard you coming and uh yes. he left a present. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. No, that's awesome. But the, the, the whole experience was awesome. Like one of my favorite scenes, um, it's like getting really cold out and like you walk out and do your your bunny vest, like oh. your, your fashion show where you're like walking out, like doing your twirls. <laughs> that yeah. one was awesome. Yeah, you know, you got to have fun out there too. So I did, I did um, actually uh, more dances that I, I guess didn't make the cut. They weren't good enough. <laughs> They didn't make the cut. <laughs> That's I just awesome. won. Yeah, I did like a happy feet dance. Um, when I finally put my mucklucks on, I started wearing my mucklucks, and I don't know. I was dancing a lot. I was like, I would dance on the full moons. I just like have a. I would be like, yeah, it was fun. But <laughs> did you make mucklucks or did you bring them? I made them before the show and then brought them out there. Nice. Yeah. So ca- yeah. kind of both. But yeah, that was kind of my question was, I didn't know if they count those. They don't count them as an item, right? It's not. It's part of your clothes. So you get your 10 items and then a specific list of clothing. And, mm. you know, those would be your shoes. So you get you get um, two sets of boots, actually. You get your, like, early season boot and your late season boot. So wow. the mucks were my late season boot. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's a good move. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and that the rabbit vest was the trip to Jordan, you know, because I was like, oh, yeah, Jordan made a rabbit vest, too, so I got it. And I, like, cracked up when he did the fashion show. And so I was like, I, to- I got to, like, you know, do that for Jordan and just, like, I'm sure people would love, like, just remembering that moment for him. And I did, you know how he did, like, the announcers and his, like, little, he, like, pretended to be other people? I did that, too. I, like, <laughs> had this different, I, like, did my hair different and everything and, like, took extra time. But they didn't use it, and I thought it was really funny. Um, I think I was, I was Helga, Helga <laughs> at the uh, Arctic Fashion Show. Um, <laughs> but anyway, they, I don't know why they didn't use it. I thought it was pretty good. Uh, <laughs> no, they're, they're honestly losers for not using that. And well, <laughs> you know, they can't fit everything in, but, um, you know, I understand um, Jordan's a legend, though. That guy, he's an alone uh, history legend. Like, his whole experience, like, that dude just crushed it. Yeah, he's he's amazing. He's awesome. Yeah, and for him, he's just like, like, none of it was a big deal either. He's just like, he's just like, yeah, I mean, he's like lived, he's like, yeah, I've lived with the Evenki reindeer herders. This is like, really chill. It's like, no problem. I'm totally cool when they came, you know, him. yeah, he's, he's an absolutely incredible. His mornings, he would always start with a, well, today it's time to go out and uh, skin the Wolverine. And it's just <laughs> like, he was just like waking up on a normal day. And he's just like going out to chill. <laughs> yeah. I loved he, yeah, he's a very amazing person super skilled he's really skilled but his personality is also incredible so it was he was so so fun to watch on there (laughs) yeah he's super humble like he has such a respect for like the environment around him he's like yeah he's so skilled but he's not like boisterous about it he's just like 
yeah, this is all like a crazy experience. Like, even though he's able to make it look so easy. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, uh, really the last chapter of alone from the viewer's eyes is this crazy toe issue. And I've seen so many, uh, comments and people asking about how you're doing now. Um, which is beautiful. People actually care to ask. It's awesome. But what's, uh, what's the deal with the toe? How did that develop? What was the, the story behind that? Yeah, it's, I mean, again, you know, for the show, they, they only have so much time to tell a story and, uh, you know, you're out there for so long, so many things happen. And so they kind of have to simplify the storyline, which I totally get it. You know, that's what you have to do as a storyteller. Um, but it was this, like, it was a whole thing with the toe, um, how that happened, but it's like kind of a long story. Um, uh, but it, but I mean, part of it is like when your body tells you something, you have to listen to it. Yeah. And I was, there was so much to do in the day cause you're doing everything for yourself and you're filming it and the days are short. And so, you know, my feet would get cold and I was like, it's all good. I'm just going to like push through a few more hours, um, until I go make a, I'm not going to bother making a fire in the middle of the day. I'm going to wait to the end of the day. Um, and, and also you're like on your toes all the time, like kneeling. So on the trap line or like building and like working on things. Um, I was on my knees a lot and like pushing my toes into the ground. Yeah. Um, and so that pressure is never good, like on a cold toe. Um, I don't know how much of this story I should tell, but anyway, obviously you guys know what ended up happening in the end. Um, but my toes are good now. They're, they're sensitive, uh, but they healed. It was crazy. Like the tip of my toe was like black and dead and it, um, eventually like came off and my toe regrew a new, like the tip of my toe regrew. It was incredible. Whoa. Um, they had me, the safety team had me th like thinking that I might need surgery and like all this like crazy stuff that might, might have to happen and that I might be like just missing, that I might ha like lose part of my toe. Um, but that didn't, it ended up not happening and my toes look totally normal, but um, they're really sensitive. So I have to, even in this weather, it's only 30 degrees, but I have to just take care of them. They get cold really easy. Even my hands too. I didn't get frostbite on my hands, but I think I probably got frost nip or something because it, uh, it was insane how cold it was insane. And there's a lot of things that you have to do. You can't do with gloves on. So you have to pop your gloves off to like mess with the camera, like the camera buttons. I couldn't turn the camera on without taking my glove off or change batteries, stuff like that. So they were so cold. Um, and there's, they're extra sensitive now too. So now I just have sensitive toes and fingers and that's all good. You got to just live with it. Yeah. I've been dabbling in the, uh, the cold weather camping and especially when you have like ultralight gear there's like those circumstances where you're not wearing much but you have to take your gloves off for just maybe it's like 30 to 45 seconds but like that 30 to 45 seconds is so painful like you're like trying to get it done and it's not even just camera stuff like stuff that requires more dexterity like knots. it could be like no yeah knots or like carving something really small or doing anything that requires a lot of dexterity and mm -hmm. you have to take your gloves off for that small time. It's a, it's a serious sacrifice. You're like, do I really want to do it? Do I really want to get these off? Like, I got to think about this. Yeah, totally. totally. It's, uh, the, and that's what I try to tell people is like, you can't convey uh, cold weather through TV properly. Like you can't explain to people how cold it is through a television while you're sitting in a 70 degree room like it just it won't register in your mind how cold it is it is it's hard to imagine until you've experienced it and um fun fact maybe it's like a secret or it's not a secret but it's not like hasn't been out there that much that was the coldest weather i've ever experienced like warning um i got you still though uh, okay good okay good 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 um yeah, but that was, but I mean, I've like, 
I don't, I have some winter, I mean, winter camping, yes, but like, I don't go to the coldest places in the winter. I try to go to the warmer places in the winter time. So yeah. I had, yeah, that was like by far the coldest weather I'd ever experienced. And it's hard to understand what it actually, it, what it feels like until you just feel it. And you're like, oh, I didn't know it could feel like this on my body. <laughs> Yeah, it's a weird deal. It's like a, a weird sensation that you can't imagine it. It's just, you've got to be there to feel it. Um, so what's going on now, post alone? What are you doing? You're just, you're living. Uh, are you alone all the time? Um, well, I hang out. Well, I, I am never alone because I have goats that follow me everywhere. <laughs> so these guys just follow me around like dogs um, and just stop that. Um, <laughs> um, and then I hang out with my sister too. My sister's kind of staying with me sometimes. Um, and my teenage sister, Skyly. So that's been pretty fun. Her and I kick it. She does her own thing sometimes too, but she's like my, my main, the main human that I've been spending time with. So, um, that's awesome. Main non goat person. So the, the significant other from the alone show is not in the picture now. Uh, no, I mean, we're, we're friends, we're still friends and stuff, but, um, yeah, things have kind of shifted. Things have shifted for us as far as how much time we spend together and everything. So, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Totally respect it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a, a lot of people I've talked to about you, they, they wonder what it's like, like what, what is your daily life like post alone? What it, where are you like in terms of are you on public land or do you hang out on private land what's your day mm -hmm. look like mm -hmm. um i should just borrow one from roland and just be like i'm at at large in north america <laughs> i'm somewhere <laughs> um yeah but i spend time on uh I'll, I'll be more real about it though but i spend time on public and private land. So on the, like the private mm -hmm. land that I'm on, I have permission. I'm not squatting or anything, um, <laughs> but um, you know, from friends and stuff that have land, a lot of people really want the goats around. I mean, they don't care about me, but the, <laughs> the goats eat weeds and like, they can really, they do a lot of good for an environment. They eat things down, they fertilize everywhere they go and then they make amazing milk. And so they're like they're wanted people that don't have goats on their land want them around so it's um really easy to get permission from friends to come and post up for a little while uh and then i just love getting out in the back country and just exploring you know go, returning to places that i've been to before but also exploring places that i haven't been and it's mm -hmm. just um it's yeah it's i feel really really fortunate that i i feel fortunate and blessed to be able to kind of live like that but also i've taken a lot of intentions and had to give up a lot um to do that too but yeah no you absolutely deserve it it's a it's a cool lifestyle and that was kind of one of the things i was thinking about uh actually got so we've got a couple questions here mm -hmm. i'm guessing you're on about 10 percent, so maybe we can <laughs> rapid fire through them but you answered the first part of this question so maybe this is a good place to start so it was uh how do you live as a nomad in a world where everything's owned, do you get permission? And you said yes. And then the follow-up was, do you get paid to watch people's land? And my thought is, goats eat weeds, they make poop, which is nitrogen, which goes into plants, which makes bigger plants. Mm -hmm. So in my mind, that's a great question, is right. are people paying you to bring livestock into certain environments? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I have been paid to like caretake people's land before more of like, to look after their animals too, like that kind of thing. Like, for example, not that many if you have milk animals, you can't leave. Um, yeah. Because you have your milk animals, unless you're like me and your milk animals go with you wherever you go. Um, mm -hmm. So being able to like, stay at someone's place and milk their animals for them, stuff like that can be helpful. Um, but as far as getting paid for grazing, I haven't done that. Um, usually I have some friends that do that and you kind of need, typically you have a bigger herd, say you have like 50 or a hundred animals and mm. then, then you get paid. I have a friend um, that does that here in Montana. They graze on BLM land. And so the, the government pays them to bring their animals and graze the weeds down on BLM land. So it's a great, 
it's a great gig, but what I do is a little bit more, my herd is a subsistence herd. They provide for me. I live off of them, milk and meat and packing capacity. And I train them. All of them have a lot of training and they're trained as packers and that kind of thing. So, um, I, yeah, more have a subsistence herd, which isn't quite big enough to warrant getting paid to eat weeds. Um, so. Awesome. That's super, that's great insight. That, that mm-hmm. is super clear to me now in my head. It's kind of about the, the size of the herd and the intention and what you're training them for. So that's, right. that's cool. But on small uh, scale places, there's still, even a small herd, they're going to have a positive impact on small scale places. But usually when you're getting like a, con- a weed eating contract, it's a mm-hmm. big scale operation. So, yeah. Right. Yeah. That makes sense. Just mm-hmm. right. Scale in terms of how many goats you have. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So a couple more questions. I'm trying to fit them in before you lose power. Uh, this is from Ed Bushcraft. He's a younger kid. So it's, I think it's a really cool question. He's asking, uh, what age were you certain about the lifestyle that you wanted? And how did you make the jump? Mm. When I was... I would say, I mean, when I was a kid, I'd have, I did feel this kind of feeling in this pull, but it was when I was about 15, age 15 Mm. is when I really was like, I just, I want to live in the wilderness. I just want it. And the jump, you know, when I was 15, I didn't really jump. It's like, you can just take small steps. And when I was 15, there wasn't that much I could do, but there still was a lot. I mean, I started, I got obsessed with plant books. I got every single plant book I could get my hands on. I Mm -hmm. studied them. I'd walk around, you know, we'd go on like, you know, any, I would just like have a backpack full of plant books and be trying to like learn the plants and stuff like that. So just whatever your natural interest is, just try to, you know, learn about it. And I would really recommend like you can save a lot of time if you find a mentor, somebody that already knows the thing that you want to know and learn from Mm -hmm. them. You'll learn so much quicker than teaching yourself through books, which is what I started to do when I was a teenager. Yeah, that's great advice. Mm -hmm. Uh, Courtney wants to know what was the most challenging thing mentally when you were on alone? Um, The most challenging thing mentally was knowing that the experience could end before I was ready to have it end from the very beginning. I, cause the, that you sign up like for it, you know, you can get pulled. They can pull you yeah. for weight. They can pull you for whatever they deem unsafe. They can pull you out of there. Um, and that to me was really hard to think, Oh, this could end before I'm ready for it to end. Right. And, So that was the hardest thing mentally and going in as a skinny person. I am a skinny person. I tried so hard to put on weight. I put on a little, but it wasn't a lot. And so I was really, but mentally I was like, if I get pulled for weight, that's just, that, that was the thing that was hard for me. Um, But I made peace with it. And one of my biggest, I don't know, one of my very big awakenings out there and sort of this like whole insight was surrendering to that like that is out of my like the things that are out of my control and the things that are in my control because even if I was eating every day which I was eating all the Mm -hmm. time eating every day I still could lose weight and still get pulled and I had to just surrender to that fact and then just realize I'm gonna have the best time out here and enjoy every moment and learn as much as I can and yeah I might not be able to stay you know they might pull me out before I'm ready to go but I surrendering to that it was I could talk for a while about this awakening, but it was very profound. It completely shifted my way of just seeing the world and the sense of freedom I feel because a lot of freedom is in your own mind. Like if you Mm -hmm. feel free or not, it's not your circumstances, it's your mind because there's always going to be, there's so much is out of our control. And like you think controlling the thing is going to make you feel free. It's like surrendering to the fact that I am not in control is where now I am free. You know what I'm saying? That's, that, yeah. No, that is awesome. That, yeah. that, hit, that hit home for sure. Um, <laughs> that, that was great. Yeah. And uh, no, I, I think I think we did a, a solid job of answering their questions. And Callie, I just want to say thank you so much for uh, hopping on the show and uh, sharing all your experiences there like no one else's that I've ever talked to. So I appreciate you so much. And I can say that uh, 
you, my friend, are, are definitely wild. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Ryan. Well, it was awesome. Such a pleasure. Thanks so much for having me on and inviting me to do this. It was fun. And the goats liked it, too. So... <laughs> Awesome. Well, we'll definitely have to, we'll have to do another one and, and check in with everyone and the goats soon. Hey guys. <laughs> they just, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Callie. Yeah. Thanks, Ryan. And thanks for everyone who watched too, everyone who's watching and commenting and stuff. It's really, the lives to me are so special because it feels, there's like a connection there. I feel there's a connection. I feel, I feel you guys, I feel you out there. So Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Uh, awesome night. And uh, we'll see you next time. So stay wild. All right. Be wild. <laughs>